It's a great uh, gift in the 20th century that uh, several people have begun um, speaking of grandiosity in a way that's not negative. If you understand me how all the way through our childhood we got the negative form of that. And somehow it survives through college. And Blake was one of my greatest defenders in, in the grandiosity. The, the roaring of the stormy sea and the nakedness of a woman and the violence of the lion, those are portions of eternity. Too great for the eye of man. Can you hear the grandiosity of that? Whoa. So I took a course in Blake, and uh, we went on that, and then I went to, to lunch one day with my two teachers, and uh, they, they said, uh, basically they said, you know Blake's crazy. <laughs> and that was it, boy, I put the curse on them and never spoke to them again. Because <laughs> when you have a couple of sons of bitches academics trying to destroy the grandiosity of the man in whom you really feel, the woman in which you really feel that, you got to move. You've got to move to protect the one who has been your mentor. You know, you can feel, then after I went, I went back to the farm, uh, and, uh, and I thought about why it is that, that when I went back to the farm, I wrote my first good poems. And a part of that was because the grandiosity that I had been allowed to feel was still associated with those little hills and little places like that. And so the first one I ever wrote, oh, in an early morning, I think I shall live forever. Well, there's a tiny bit of grandiosity there. <laughs> At least I put in, I think. <laughs> oh, in an early morning, I think I will live forever. I am wrapped in my joyful flesh as the grass is wrapped in its clouds of green. So I'm saying that I, I, because my grandiosity was not killed, my flesh was kind of joyful. But in my model is nature. I am wrapped in my joyful flesh as the grass is wrapped in its clouds of green. Rising from a bed where I dreamt of long rides past castles and hot coals. <laughs> Typical dreaming of uh, European castles as farm kid, you know. Right? Rising from a bed where I dreamt of long rides past castles and hot cold. The sun, the sun is glad to be sitting on my knee. <laughs> anyway, it made a good line. Anyway. The sun lies happily on my knee. I have suffered and survived the night, bathed in dark water, like any blade of grass. And I'll tell you what, let's go and just do the second part of it. I'll go back and finish the poem in a minute. So grandiosity in you, Robert Moore is about to say in the book, is really an implant from God. It's an implant, like you put an implant in the brain. And it's very dangerous because when, you, when it comes out in the form of Savonarola, he's got this God implant. What does he do? He takes half of the great books written in Florence, brings them all to the square and burns them. So we would have been a lot better off in a way if this hadn't happened. But, but at the same time, because we have an implant from God, everyone is a religious person. And... Um, that's an extreme way of saying it. The other way of saying it is just there's this beautiful grandiosity. And sometimes the women are more ruined by their mothers in this area than the boys. Is that clear? And one of the reasons they love looking at a young male is that often some of his grandiosity has survived and they know it. And Traherne has a beautiful little poem in which he says that when I was six years old or something, I saw the children running along the street and they were like moving jewels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when a young woman sees a young man, it's just like a moving jewel. And uh, the jewel quality is of that grandiosity which wasn't killed. And sometimes the mothers of such boys uh, really do love those boys. And sometimes the father does too. So. So we want to say that, and, uh, and anyone want to tell me now, how do you understand the grandiosity I'm talking about?
Yes, please. You see it as an integral part of every creative person. All right, what's wrong with what he just said? It's an integral part of every person. Every creative person? No, every, every person. And the creative person is the one through whom accidentally it survives into language or into painting. Like Van Gogh, constant God implant. Every time he does a painting, it's a clearer. The grandiosity does not exist alone in you. It exists with a pair, another being, another thing, which we could call despicability. There's something in you which feels absolutely worthless, <coughs> despicable. Um, and uh, do you understand how hard that is for those two to exist together? A lot, of, a lot of times in AA you'll hear us say, we have a huge grand, grandiosity with an equally huge inferiority complex uh -huh. at the same time. Yeah. But uh, the, the problem is that if you start in, as an AA attacking the grandiosity, it right. may just increase, huh? Yeah. Right. It may just increase the other one. So, yeah. so uh, I, I've just begun to understand this, really. Um, <clears throat> because my poems have all come out of that kind of grandiosity, uh, which I protected as much as I can. And yet it is an interesting thing that uh, when I got out of college, um, I didn't want to go into a university because uh, for many different reasons, uh, one of which is I, I love teaching so much, I didn't know that, but I would teach myself away. Uh, so it is best for me not to do that. Um, but also, um, what I did was went to New York and uh, I didn't uh, have a job and I had a job one day a week uh, as a house painter and uh, some of my friends know this story. It almost ended in my death. But, um, but there I was, uh, you know, I was I'd go down the street and uh, looking for a dime down in, uh, in old Italy, I remember, in those places. And um, why would that be there? because my soul needed evidence that I was of my despicability. Is that clear? There's some way in which I couldn't live out that one without living out that one. And if I'd gone to university, I wouldn't have had a chance to live that out. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that people are wrong to go to university. I just say that since my grandiosity was that large, it needed also the other part of it. And I, in this poem, it begins, and what does that do in the second line? Um, oh, in an early morning, I think, I, oh, in an early morning, I, I'll just do it. Oh, in an early morning, I think I shall live forever. I am wrapped in my joyful flesh as the grass is wrapped in its clouds of green. Rising from a bed where I dreamt of long rides past castles and hot coals. The sun lies happily on my knees. I have suffered and survived the night, bathed in dark water like any blade of grass. Do you understand how I'm describing my two, three years in New York there? I have suffered and survived the night, bathed in dark water like any blade of grass. You know, so I don't have self-pity about it, like any blade of grass. The strong leaves of the box elder trees, and it was under this farm and there's little old trees that survived the depression. The strong leaves of the box elder trees plunging in the wind call us to disappear into the wilds of the universe. The strong leaves of the box elder trees plunging in the wind call us to disappear into the wilds of the universe where we shall sit at the foot of a plant and live forever like the dust, like the dust. And that last two lines I owed to the Chinese because the old Chinese would say, oh yeah, you Americans, you Westerners, you always go into places like uh, um, Paris and Paris, they got these big cathedrals. Now that's okay, but you know, there's a weed in your backyard and if you just sat down and kneeled to that, save you a lot of money. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
The strong leaves of the box elder trees plunging in the wind call us to disappear into the wilds of the universe where we shall sit at the foot of a plant and live forever like the dust. So that's got two lines in there of that. I just want you to remember that, to try to be conscious of both those uh, parts of yourself, the feeling that you're absolutely worthless. And that comes about, maybe it comes about from your mother saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, you're not such a big shot. I don't know, maybe I should add that. Hmm? And maybe not, maybe it's born into us in the same way. What are you thinking? I'm, just, I'm having a little problem trying to put that in the context of shadow or shame, whether or not this is the same animal or it's, or it's a different shade. Of well, no, I don't think it has to do with shame. I think it's born inside of you. It's like some molecules that notify you that you're absolutely worthless. Okay, so let's go back to this a second. In, uh, in the early new poems I've been writing, for the first time I've tried to express some of that second layer. And in, uh, in, uh, or in the Muslim world, it's called an afs. And it's something in you that cannot be saved. As a greedy soul, I use the word greedy soul, and I'll give you a little stanza I had in, in this book. I live very close to my greedy soul. When I see a book published 2,000 years ago, I check to see if my name is mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and then people look at me shocked, you know, and I say, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, it's true. <laughs> Just put me in an old antique store, book published 1,500, you know, 500, I'll check to see if my name's in the back. So that thing is interesting because, because of the mixture of the two. I live very close to my greedy soul. Hmm? And then when I see a book published 2,000 years ago, I check to see if my name is meant. That's really grandiose. <laughs> Whoa! In that case, the, the stuff comes first and then the grandiose. Does it make any sense to you? So that's what I like now, is to have a stanza or a poem in which both these two are present. <coughs> Um, because I'm honoring the grandiosity and I also have to honor that part of myself. Even he thinks that in certain places he is lowly. Is that right? <laughs> All right, I'm going to read you a poem about the grandiosity now. This is from a new book. You ready? It's hard to know how all this wealth came to be. How did this God implant come in us? It's hard to know how all this wealth came to be. Ishmael was not created from a fight with a whale. The ocean is not wild enough to have created Melville's soul. And I'm going to do the Muslim thing here, so I repeat the same word at the end of every, every stanza. That's their way of coming towards form. The ocean is not wild enough to have created a Melville soul. The hungry one in us did not come from seed. Our old enemy is one of Adam's grandfathers. He stood around looking at the shadow of the first soul. I'm thinking of the king of your worthlessness. The hungry one in us did not come from seed. Our old enemy is one of Adam's grandfathers. He stood around looking at the shadow of the first human soul. The ark landed on our rat, but all those who came off the ark knew that the voyage was not long enough to have created Abraham's soul. No, yeah, Abraham's soul. The ark landed on Ararat, but all of those who came off the ark know that the voyage was not long enough to produce Abraham's soul. Oaks once darkened almost all of Great Britain, covering it with leaves, but squirrels rummaging in a million acorns could not find Chaucer's soul. <laughs> Oaks once darkened almost all of Great Britain, co covering it with leaves, but squirrels rummaging in a million acorns could not find Chaucer's soul. How many boulders had to be ground down to create one square inch of the Sahara? Maybe the moon gave birth to Mandela's soul. There's a man with a big soul. How many boulders had to be ground down to produce one square inch of the Sahara? Maybe the moon gave birth to Mandela's soul. Last answer. There's a mystery about the birth of Jesus. All that snow that fell to earth Christmas Eve finally did shift for an instant 
the weight of Rome's soul. So, you know, I know that as a liberal, I'm supposed to make fun of Jesus. I mean, we all know that. But I, I'm too old for that shit. <laughs> There's a mystery about the birth of Jesus. All that snow that fell to earth Christmas Eve finally did shift for an instant the weight of Rome's soul. Anyway, that's the way it looks like. A poem looks that way. When you allow your grandiosity to come forward and be honored, am I saying anything to you? And you separate your friends from the ones who will put down your grandiosity and the ones that will support it. And when you got a guy and he puts down your grandiosity three times, you say, that's it, buddy. Your name is out of my book. Don't ever call me again. That's it. You understand what I'm saying? This grandiosity needs to be protected. And you can also get out the ones who compliment you all the time. Compliment me four times today, buddy. That's it. Your name is out of my book. I don't need that shit. I'll praise myself. I mean, we always like to be complimented, but you know that the one in the end who is praising you all the time has got something else in mind. Yeah. Let's do something here about the, uh, the lack of grandia. Let's celebrate another day lost to eternity. Minute by minute we eke out the story, but the spider is on his way from night to night. The mailman is not the one who ruins our life. Wind has an affair with a million grains of sand. Each sand grain has more power than Xerxes. Yay. Right. Just to bring Xerxes into the poem <laughs> of an American, I mean, whoa. <laughs> And there's an old tradition that, uh, that this world is not only run by God, but there's a dark uh, lord of this world. It's called the Demiurge. During those months while we slept in the womb, the Demiurge gave us a taste for war so that we were born mortgaged and howling. Hey, uh... <coughs> so don't talk to me about my shame, man. The Demiurge gave me a taste for war. During those months while we slept in the womb, the Demiurge gave us a taste for war so that we were born mortgaged and howling. So we got a taste for war at the same time we got this wonderful grandiosity. Isn't that right? That's right. Madame Bovary could not endure the good life. She was like us. She wanted disgraceful nights, torn clothes, and the inconstant heart. See, in, the, in, the, in this Muslim poem called The Guzzle, you're able to shift the contents the subject matter with every stanza, if you wish. I just shifted it. Man in Bovary could not endure the good life. She was like us. She wanted disgraceful nights, torn clothes, and the inconstant heart. Uh, this is a little painful, this next stanza, but it's also in the grandiosity. The impover our impoverishment follows naturally from our wealth. Is that right? Even as a nation, our impoverishment follows naturally from our wealth. Right. The pain that man and wife feel at breakfast each day goes back to decisions in heaven. The pain that man and wife feel at breakfast each day, it isn't your fault. It isn't your wife's fault. The pain that man and wife feel at breakfast each day goes back to decisions in heaven. Hmm? That's grandiose. Can you feel it? It implies that someone else wanted us to lead a certain kind of life and we're leaving it. So what are you complaining about? The decisions, the pain that man and wife feel at breakfast each day goes back to decisions in heaven. I'm just about ready to understand that. Just on the edge of that. Last one. What will you say to Mahler about his daughter who died young? He was crazy about his daughter. He was doing great symphonies and everything in Vienna. What will you say to Mahler about his daughter who died young? There were, there were closed carriages in Vienna. Freud tried to cure the insufficiency of our sorrow. Everyone is attacking Freud, but he just wanted to make you understand how much sorrow there is in human life. How you can't solve anything. Can't, you understand what I'm saying? If 
Freud tried to cure the insufficiency of our sorrow. He didn't try to cure the sorrow. He said, you're not feeling enough of it. Let me uh, read some of my books. <laughs> it says, uh, thank you, Sigmund. <laughs> but we're not going to read them anymore now. Because <laughs> we got Seinfeld <laughs> instead of Freud. We got Seinfeld instead of Freud. I'm going to read you one more poem now. And it isn't mine, but it's a poem by um, Hafez. He's the great, greatest of all of the uh, Muslim poets. Uh, in, in Iran, he and Rumi uh, are the great ones. Rumi, as Coleman has brilliantly done, is very, very wonderful in, in telling you what the magnificent um, grandiosity there is in you and everything. And Hafez is a little harsher in that area. <clears throat> but I want you to remember that this is another way to carry grandiosity, not only saying as Rumi does, you know, every blade of grass is beautiful and and everything comes up to you and wants to kiss you. And remember that one I recited yesterday to someone else? I want to kiss you. That's what your grandiosity says to God. I want to kiss you, God says. The price of kissing is your life. Talking just like a guy in the mafia. <laughs> the price of kissing is your life. And Rumi says, now my loving is running towards my life, shouting, what a bargain, let's buy it. <laughs> <laughs> now my loving is running towards my life saying, what a bargain, let's buy it. Can you feel that? Woo, that's great, that's great. All right, this is a, a Hafez. <clears throat> Don't expect obedience, promise keeping, or rectitude from me, I'm drunk. I've been famous for carrying a wine pitcher around since the first covenant with Adam. Remember, he's a Muslim. But the wine he's talking about is also spiritual wine. The very moment that I cleansed myself in the spring of love, that very day, I said four times over this world as over a corpse, God is great. Yeah. So he looks at the whole world when he was 22 and he decided to look like a corpse. And he says over it what Muslims say over a corpse, God is great. Give me some wine so I can pass on news of the mystery of fate, of whose face it is with whom I have fallen in love and whose fragrance has made me drunk. The mountain's withers are actually tinier than the withers of an ant. You who love the fragrance of wine, don't lose hope about the door of mercy being open. Again? Uh, except for the nodding Narcissus blossom, may the evil eye not touch it, no creature has ever been really comfortable beneath this turquoise dome. May my soul be sacrificed to, to your mouth, because in the garden of contemplation, nobody has ever been created by the gardener of the world sweeter than yours. He's talking to a woman, but he's also talking to God. May my soul be sacrificed to your mouth. Go ahead and eat me. Because in the garden of contemplation, nobody has ever been created by the gardener of the world sweeter than yours. And the last one, Partly because of his love for you, Hafez became as rich as Solomon. Yeah. Can you feel the terrific grandiosity there? Partly because of his love for you, Hafez became as rich as Solomon. And from his union with you, like Solomon, I have nothing but wind in my hand. And because of his union with you, like Solomon, I have nothing but wind in my hand. So in other words, when you're doing strong poems with your grandiosity coming forward, you have to end it in a way that suggests how little in the end you have of anything in this world. So the greatest triumph is to overcome your parents' declaration that you didn't have any grandiosity. And the, the effort is to really do that and come forward. And when he does his, his dance and all that, when everybody here does this thing, they're overcoming that thing. And you're presenting yourself as something wonderful. You understand me? To do that in your poems, which Americans are not doing now. They're just saying, yesterday I went down the street in my bicycle and I saw a woman outside the, the laundromat. And I said to her, yeah, I think that woman has had some trouble. And then I hit a dog and, and then I went home and I had a drink and that's it. <laughs> 
The greatest need for you is to overcome in your writing the feeling that, that you, you shouldn't express your, your grandiosity. Language is for the expression of grandiosity. And then, uh, so that's the first effort, to allow that to come into your poem. And then the second effort is not to take credit for it. And that's what he does here. He says, you know, because, uh, I've, because of you, I've become as rich as Solomon. But because of my love for you, like Solomon, I have nothing but wind in my hand. I wish we could talk longer, and I haven't said these things before, so I'm very clumsy in saying them. But uh, I can feel uh, there's something very important in that second thing. Yeah. <laughs>